Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's good to see you here. Well, I can't see you, but I know that you're there. Um, so this is our session on publishing, the first session on publishing, which is uh, publishing in journals, journal articles. We all know how important those are um, in advancing academic careers and getting our ideas um, shared more broadly. So we've got four representatives of journals here. We've got um, Grace Ong from the Journal of International Development. We've got Cheryl Voss from Oxford Development Studies. We've got uh, Murat from Development, De Development and Change. And we've got Ken Shadlin from Journal of Development Studies. So the way we're going to handle it, we've got 50 minutes together. The way we're going to handle it is to have presentations from each of those representatives of the journals, one after another. So they will be consecutive, and then we'll take questions at the end. For the questions, please don't use the text, but use the question mark that is on your screen, because text chat is for kind of um, technical issues that you might have with, with your um, access to the session. On that, if you have serious issues, the best thing might be simply to exit your browser and come back in. Sometimes that sorts things. When you do put questions, and I'll remind you at the end after everybody has spoken, please specify who they are for. So if you've got a question for Cheryl or for Grace or for Murat or for Ken, or if you can't remember their names, but you remember the journal names, please specify who they are for. If it's for everybody, you can specify that too. And that will help us in sorting, sorting through the questions at the end of the presentations. I think that's, a, that's all I need to say. So I will um, sit back in the audience and listen, listen to how to get published. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Grace Ong, Senior Journalist Publishing Manager at Wiley. And I'll be giving a brief overview of the publishing process and some information about the Journal of International Development. So next slide. So the first step is to decide where you want to submit your paper. So look at where recently published papers in the field are published and you can also ask for suggestions from your supervisor and colleagues as well. So once you have a short list of journals or a particular journal in mind, read the journal's aims and scope and author guidelines carefully. If necessary, invest in language editing upfront and spend time on writing your abstract. Make sure your abstract spells out clearly the contribution of your paper. What is new? Why is it interesting? And why does it matter to the field? Next slide. So once you have decided which journal to submit, go to the submission site. Um, nowadays, most journals use an electronic editorial office, such as Scholar One Manuscripts or Editorial Manager. So you will, you will submit the paper electronically. If this is your first paper, consider registering for an ORCID ID. An ORCID ID is a unique identifier that stays with you throughout your career so that all your publications will be correctly attributed to you. Um, most journals using the online submission site will allow you to nominate suggested reviewers as up to three more typically. So select wisely and make sure that these are actually experts in the field of research and not just compiled from your personal contacts. If you are asked to submit your manuscript, uh, sorry, if you're asked to revise your manuscript, please make sure you submit your revision on or before the deadline. However, during this pandemic, most editorial offices have been understanding and will allow extensions if you ask for it. Now is also the time to think about data. Um, data are regarded as part of the research output, and more and more, journals are increasingly encouraging or mandating authors to provide a statement about the data they use or collected as part of your research. So think about the data. Where do they currently live? Do you want to share it? And if so, how should you share the data? Is it a statement about data will be available on request or the data is hosted in an open access repository and here's the link to it. So give it some thought at this stage here. If your article has been accepted, congratulations. What happens next is that your article will be transferred to the publisher who will turn it into article proofs. Check and return your corrections as soon as possible. Um, this, at this stage, it is not the time to rewrite complete paragraphs or sections. It is really giving it 
uh, overview, make sure that obvious mistakes have been corrected and that the final article is of the quality and standard that you're happy with. Now, some publishers such as Wiley, we have uh, open access funding arrangements with funders or institutions. If you're eligible, you'll be asked whether you'd like to make your article open access. So decide whether you want to take it up or not. And once you've made the decision, make sure you sign the correct license agreement. And when, once your article is published, now is the time to share it. Share it with your colleagues. You can either share links to the article or read on the access. And if you're active on social media, make sure you promote your article on social media as well. And lastly, don't forget to update your institutional profile with your latest publication. And if your article is rejected, commiserations, that happens to most people. Um, so you're not alone here. Uh, if that happens, the honest answer is that you will probably have to repeat the same process again. Um, but there are a few things you can do to improve your chances the next time round. Um, the first thing is to read the reasons for rejection carefully and try to revise your article before resubmitting to another journal. Uh, secondly, most journals will offer a transfer option to other journals published by the same publisher. If this option is available, the recommended journal could be a better fit for you for your article and if you decide to take it up on it, the submitted files as well as the reviews will be transferred automatically to the receiving journal. What this means is that it will save time because you don't have to go through the submission process again. And if you had addressed all the comments in a revised paper, the editors might make an executive decision and make a decision on your paper without sending it up for another round of review. So this means that your paper could end up being published sooner as well. And going on to my last slide. So that is the, uh, a, a very brief overview of the publication process. So now I'm going to turn my attention and talk a little bit about the Journal of International Development. So JIT is a broad scope development journal. It publishes all sorts of topics that are broadly related to development. Uh, make sure that your paper addresses the issue of international development. The editors are looking for originality, significance, as well as rigor. And what this means is that they are looking for answers to the question of what is new and interesting about your paper? Is there an in-depth discussion that links theory and empirics? Are the methods and data used in the analysis clear and relevant? And lastly, Think about your audience. Think about who will be reading and citing your paper later on. If your paper is very technical, how can you make it more accessible to non-academic audience, such as practitioners and policy makers? And again, if, it's, if your paper will have some policy relevance, focus on what the findings mean for policy makers and make sure that you highlight that clearly in your paper. Um, so that's my five minutes. Up. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand over now to the next presenter. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so again, I'm Cheryl Doss. I'm the editor of Oxford Development Studies, and I'm going to start by saying just a bit about our journal and then talk a little bit in more depth than Grace did about thinking about how to choose an appropriate journal for your article. So in January, Oxford Development Studies, we relaunched the journal. We have International Advisory Board. And the real new thing that we've done is a very strong commitment to seek to include more high quality research from the perspective of those traditionally marginalized in academic publications, particularly authors from the Global South. Um, we published articles, um, a, a range of, of articles. It could be either grounded in one particular region of the world or something comparative. Um, we publish articles that are interdisciplinary as well as those that are rooted in a single discipline, such as politics, anthropology, sociology, geography, history. Um, but we're also committed to the idea that the articles should all be accessible and relevant to a broader audience. Um, I find that this is particularly a problem when people are submitting articles and the, the submitter is an economist. They tend to write very narrow focused papers um, on economics and not make them accessible to a broader audience. We welcome economics papers, just like we welcome other disciplinary papers, but we want them, we want people to really write them in such a way 
that somebody else might see why this is important and an interesting question. Um, we're interested in papers that are looking, um, most of our papers are have a strong empirical component to it, focused on development, on field-based research in developing countries. Um, although we are willing to take a look at ones that are much more theoretical in nature. Um, we also do both qualitative and quantitative papers, are happy for both of those, as well as papers that are mixed methods. Um, so let me just say a little bit about choosing a journal, because I think that's the first step that you have to think about when you're thinking about publishing. And it actually will affect how you write the paper, at least in the last stages. So you don't wanna write the whole paper and then think, well, where, where do I wanna send this? As you're writing it, you wanna be thinking about where you're going, which journals you're gonna be sending it to. So you wanna take, a, I mean, the first, the best way to start is to look at other, look at the range of journals, look at what they're publishing, see where you think there might be a good fit for your particular article. So you want to identify journals that are using, where the articles in those journals are addressing similar types of issues, both in terms of subject and in terms of scope. They ought to be open to the kind of methodology that you're using, as well as the approach. Um, I think that question of whether it's primarily focused on reaching practitioners and policymakers, or whether it's much more focused on academic issues, um, is, is also a good place to start. So ODS, although we're interested and have readers who are policymakers and practitioners, we wouldn't see ourselves as primarily publishing papers um, for that audience or on those particular topics. We've got much more of an academic grounding of the journal. Um, so again, one of the first one of the first reasons that papers get desk rejected is just simply that they're not not a good fit. Um, they're, they wouldn't be necessarily of interest to our, our readers. In thinking about, right, one of the things you really want to think about with a particular paper is whether it's going to be better in a disciplinary journal that's really targeted and focused on one discipline, um, and that that's the audience that you're writing to, or whether you want to be writing to a much broader development studies audience. Um, for myself, putting on my, not my editor hat, but my author hat, what I usually do as I'm starting to think about what I'm going to do with a paper is come up with a list of not just one journal that I want to submit to, but to have a plan of I'm going to submit it to this particular journal. If I don't get it in there, then I have two or three backups that are the places that I'm thinking about um, submitting it to. Um, so again, in, in terms of thinking about tailoring the article to a particular journal, you want to, you probably want to do some of that um, in the final stages of writing, thinking about whether you're targeting it towards an interdisciplinary audience, a more disciplinary audience, disciplinary audience, towards more policy or more academic debates that you're really trying to, to situate yourself into. So I will stop there. Thanks. And in a way, I'm going to be repeating quite a bit of what uh, Cheryl and Grace before me said, because these are, in fact, very important uh, points. And my, my, my main sort of like focus in my talk, in my five minutes, is why papers get uh, a desk reject. But before I go there, let me just tell you for a few seconds about development and change. We are a generalist journal. We've been uh, publishing for now 50 years in development studies. To, the journal doesn't have any fixed uh, sort of specialization in terms of disciplines or areas we publish. Uh, the main thing we look for is critical engagement with an issue. So in that sense, we're looking for something fresh, something different, something something that pushes back on established dogmas it could be in policy it could it could be in theory but we're looking for papers that uh, challenge the read the readers and challenge challenge established understandings of how things work 
And that, that in a way, I think uh, leads me to why papers get uh, rejected uh, at the desk review stage. And I mean, development and change handles hundreds of papers a year. It's, I think the, the exact number is probably coming close to a thousand these days. And I don't, we don't keep sort of precise statistics on this, but I would say about 80% of anything that comes in never goes out to refereeing process. Papers that actually do end up in referee uh, peer review are, of course, much more likely to get published. But even if you don't get published, a journal like Development Change will easily give you three very strong referee reports. Sometimes it can be as many as five referee reports. And uh, these reports can run into pages. Our referees are very generous with their time. So if you make it to the referee stage, and even if you don't make it to publication, you end up with uh, some amazing commentary. So it's important to get past the initial hurdle. And why do papers, why do 80% of our papers that come to us uh, get rejected? The single most important probably decision is fit. Uh, Cheryl has already talked about it. Is this the right paper for the right journal? And the rightness of the paper, the fit of the paper to the journal could be the approach. So if you're just doing a straightforward randomized control trial uh, without any critical engagement with the method, development change is probably not going to be interested in this. Uh, you might not. You might not fit because you are not uh, engaging uh, with the debates that are taking place in the journal, unless you can show that what's happened in the journal is missing a key sort of dimension that you're bringing in. The editors might feel that, you know, your paper may be better sent to, let's say, if you're writing some kind of agrarian development, maybe we say, you know, this is a good paper, but not for us. These debates are taking place in agrarian change. Go there. It could be about methods. If your paper is uh, papers driven primarily by a very particular method, it could be just econometric and not that DNC, Development Change, doesn't publish uh, rigorous quantitative papers. But if your main contribution is in terms of your methods, uh, a generalist journal might have uh, second thoughts about uh, pursuing the paper. So fit is massively important. What's also important is to show what's new. Uh, a top-end journal would not just want a good paper, it would want a unique paper. We end up rejecting many, many papers. They're perfectly fine, but it is not entirely clearly clear what it is that they're adding to the broader discussion. If just a different case study on a similar, on a well-known topic is not going to get you past the initial hurdle. I, for example, work on extractive industries and conflicts with the extractive industries and communities. Uh, those of you who work in this would know that there are thousands of papers that show case studies uh, about how a particular community would fight against an oil installation. I think a paper for a paper to make it past uh, the initial uh, sort of weeding out a development change, you have to show that this case has something new. Is it and just this? The case itself being different is not enough. You have to be able to challenge either the theoretical understanding of what's going on or that your empirical findings are so fresh, so different to what we know. There's some sense of surprise. So I think the what's new question is really important. Um, since I think we have many sort of early career researchers here, I also want to talk about uh, sort of the relationship between a dissertation and a paper. Many new authors uh, rightly try to take parts of the dissertations and send it to a journal. I think sometimes it is very clear that a chapter has just been taken out and an abstract sort of put on top and then sent to a journal. That usually doesn't work very well. I think a chapter is a good basis for a paper, but it is not a paper. I think uh, there's some crafting that needs to be done that sometimes I see that doesn't quite happen as much as it should. And if you've already published out of your dissertation, I think it's important to show to the editors that if I see a paper, and most of us, I mean, development change has seven editors, so we read widely, so we know what's going out, going on in other journals. If I see another paper by an author in a different journal, 
I'd like to know what this particular submission is different from your other publications. So if you're publishing on the same PhD dissertation case study, make it very explicit to the editors how this particular submission is different from your previous publications. And finally, I think uh, editors are overburdened. The number of submissions are increasing in all the journals. As I said, we're handling hundreds of papers. Don't hide your main arguments. Don't hide the sort of like the novelty of your work. Don't hide the quality of your work. Make it very clear in the first few pages, uh, if not in the abstract, exactly why this paper is worth the attention of uh, not just uh, the editors, but also the referees that will put in countless hours giving you comments. So really come out and explain what it is that you're offering to the field. I'll leave it there for now. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Shadlin. I'm one of the managing editors of the Journal of Development Studies. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was asked to talk about how to respond to reviews, and I'll do that. But like um, the others, let me just say a word or two very quickly about the journal. Um, the Journal of Development Studies uh, is like the other journals that have talked today. It's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. I think there's sometimes been a reputation that the Journal of Development Studies is a journal of econ development. Uh, that's actually incorrect. We have papers from across the field of development studies. Uh, we do have econ papers, but we have anthropologists, geographers, sociologists, political scientists, and so on and so forth. Um, the journal also, similar to what Murad explained about development and change, it gets a huge number of submissions. Um, we do have records on this. Uh, we usually get about 14 to 1500 submissions each year and about three quarter in any given year, either three quarters or 80% of those are desk rejects. So they don't go out for review. Of course, that means that if it does go out for review, you have a better chance of being accepted. But one thing I want to start off with is a comment that uh, a revise and resubmit is not the same as conditional accept that your paper, when it goes out for review, you respond to the reviews, and we'll talk about that in just a sec, and then it's gonna go back out to the referees. And um, it's, so just the, the fact that you've been given an opportunity to do a revise and resubmit doesn't mean that you are, you should necessarily have an expectation that your paper is going to be published. So how to deal with the referees? Now, this is a, this is not an easy thing to talk about only because I think that not only do different journals have different styles, but I think different editors have different styles. So in some ways, I feel like I'm talking about how to deal with referee or how to deal with referees and the revisions from my perspective, and it may not be all that relevant for others. But let me let me make a couple of points. And I'm actually going to make some points both from the as someone who's been the editor or one of the editors for about 10 years of JDS, but also as a scholar in the field where I send my own work out. You don't need to address every single point that the referees make. So I think that a lot of times authors tear their hair out trying to address every last point. You need to, you need to acknowledge every point. So when you respond, you'll typically send back a cover sheet that will basically go through each point. And it's, it's, not, it's not criminal to say, I am not going to address this point because it takes me out of the scope of the paper, or I can't address this point because of length. So you can't just blindly ignore the points, but you don't have to sort of feel like you need to revise your paper in every single way that the referees say. The next thing I would say is that sometimes the referees will come back with suggestions that are inconsistent. Referee will A will say you need to you know, expand your literature review and include more of these studies. And referee B will say that the section on literature base is, is already too long. You need to reduce these studies. And so sometimes you, you have a set of recommendations from the referees that are fundamentally incompatible. Now, if I'm doing my job as the editor, if I'm doing my job well as the editor, I notice that. And in the letter, I provide guidance to how you might sort of reconcile the conflicting suggestions of referee one and referee two. But sometimes, hey, we all screw up. Sometimes we don't do that. And so if you have, if you have, if you have what you regard as inconsistent and incompatible recommendations from the referees, 
you should ask the editor. Um, if you don't want to ask the editor directly, ask the administrative editor of the journal, and the administrative editor will pass the question along to the editor. But that's what we're here for. Um, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say I say it many times that I actually think that working with authors to help them address the objections and make a strong paper, make a paper stronger, and get it publishing. That's what's actually fulfilling and rewarding about the role. Rejecting papers at a desk rejection stage, there's nothing rewarding about that. Selecting reviewers for a paper is not particularly rewarding, but actually taking your paper and helping you overcome the, object, the, the objections and the suggestions that the referees made and having the paper be published, that's a good thing. I enjoy doing that. That makes me feel like it's a job that's worth doing. The last thing I'm gonna say and then open it up for questions is, I think this is a really important point to remember as you're dealing with the editorial process. Referees are not the editor, and editors are not computers. And what I mean by that is that you can have your paper go out for, go back for uh, review, revise and resubmit, even if one of the referees says reject. You might even have a paper get accepted if one of the paper, if referees says reject. And likewise, the paper might get rejected even if one of the authors says accept. One of the referees says accept, excuse me. The referees provide input. They don't make the decisions. And when I say the editors are not a computer, is that we're not algorithms. We don't just basically, oh, these people said reject, this one said, you know, this, so therefore I'm going to reject. The editors make decisions, and they make decisions on the basis of the referees, but they also make this, we make our decisions on, the, on our own basis. That's, otherwise, they basically would basically fire us from being editors, and they would just hire computers to do the job. Um, and so think, remember that referees make provide advice, editors make decisions, and the editors usually are there, although we all have jobs and we're teaching and we're doing our own research, we're there to work with you to help you try to reconcile conflicting reviews from the referees and hopefully turn a paper from a strong paper into a stronger paper and get it published. Thanks. Great, thank you all. That was very, very helpful and covered a whole range of aspects of the publishing process. Um, so we've got, what we're going to do now is we're going to take questions and we're going to take them in two, um, two groups because the technology doesn't allow five of us to sit on the podium together. So I'm going to first of all ask Grace and Murat to come and sit with me on the podium. So we will ask, we will seek questions for those two um, speakers and those two publications. So that's speakers for the Journal of International Development and Development and Change. And happily, so far, we've got two questions and they both happen to be one for each of those journals. Um, so now is the time to put more questions in. And just to remind you how to do that, there is a question mark in your toolbar. Please use that question mark to ask questions. Okay, so the two questions are from Moses Segbenya in the University of Cape Coast. So the first one is for JID. Um, should I read out the question? I think that would be helpful. Okay, uh, sorry, it's disappeared from my screen. Okay, so the question is, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of sharing your data, considering the research ethics and respect for the respondents? How often do you publish in a year? Um, the answer for that is really um, down to your discretion. I think um, we are not asking you to compromise on confidentiality or ethics, but actually just making a statement about the data. So for some of you, an appropriate statement, depending on your research, would be the data is confidential, but you may send me a personal message to discuss, you know, to request for it. Or it could go on the other hand of the range to say that it is available in an open access repository. All you need to do is submit a request and you will be able to see the data. Um, so I think what we're not what we're not saying is that, you know, when you know we do understand that uh, there are confidentiality reasons and good reasons why they should be confidential. But it's sort of like uncovering the practices around data. I think that's what we're trying to understand here. 
So what are the practices around data so that we can then decide whether as a, from a publisher's perspective, whether there's need to invest in more infrastructure to, to host this, to share this, and it's all part of the whole research ecosystem here. Okay, so the second one, which is for um, Murat, coming up now. Uh, the question is, how do I get more than one article from my dissertation? And it's disabled. I think, is that acceptable was the end of it? I think, um, yes, is that acceptable? It is, it is acceptable. Uh, how do you get more than one article? I think... I think uh, this is a tricky one. I mean, it, uh, a good dissertation should yield uh, usually more than one good article. Uh, how do you get that? I think uh, your chapter structure should be in some ways a guidance to it. Uh, the literature review part of a dissertation usually, unless it's such groundbreaking, such sort of like revealing literature review, literature review chapter wouldn't uh, uh, make a standalone article, but some of your empirical chapters that can be separated, and then of course the appropriate methodological and theoretical discussions are like introduced into the chapter to make them standalone articles. I think that could usually lead to something. But I think the trick is for for a journal. I don't want to when I when I read as a. I mean I I understand the temptation of producing multiple pieces from one writing or one sort of research project. But I think the editors wouldn't necessarily want to feel that you're concealing one part of your finding so that you're trying to sort of like slice it in so many pieces. I think I want to feel that you're giving me a full story. If you can't give one full story in one article without sort of like uh, being jealously like guarding your other data, for another journal, there is no harm in producing multiple pieces out of a dissertation. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so we've got another question which is directly for development and change. So I'm gonna go with that. It often, uh, this from Aditya Mohanty, uh, it often turns down papers saying it is very single country centric and does not have residences utility for an international audience. How to deal with it? Um, this is uh, this is again uh, all these are all very good questions and very tricky. Um, this depends from country to country. To be very honest, I think uh, I'm from Cyprus, for example, and a paper on Cyprus. Uh, I think an author uh, who's writing on Cyprus has to go an extra mile and demonstrate that what's happening in Cyprus, or it could be another small country is relevant to other places. I think authors who have the, the fortune to work in a country like India or China can often just write about India and China that uh, without having to put in an additional sort of like step saying, oh, this is by the way relevant to everyone. That said, some discussions are taking place very much within a country. Yeah, just because the country is big or the topic is big doesn't mean necessarily that everyone would be interested. So I think if the debate is taking place solely within a country, and then I think there's the necessity to show how the debate is relevant for readers from other parts of the world, or for, I mean, for a generalist journal like Development Change, it should be interesting to most readers. I shouldn't have to be working on mining in China to be read a to, to read a paper on mining in China. There should be something that I can take away from it in terms of a development studies uh, scholarship that would be useful in most contexts. So I think it's about demonstrating what is the bigger picture that comes from a paper, why it's relevant to those working outside of the specific empirical or theoretical uh, boundaries of the paper. Thank you, Murat. Yeah. Okay, so one one more for Grace, and then we'll go to um, to the other two. Um, the question is the what is the estimated time between submission and publication? Are there options of open access? Um, the answer to the first question it really depends on how many rounds of revision and then how much there's a backlog. 
if I could say for Journal of International Development, I think we do try as far as possible to, once it's accepted, to publish your article um, first online within a month. That is our target. And then so, but you know, it depends. And then um, with this pandemic, um, there is a general slowdown, although we are still publishing. So I think we, we just have to be mindful of that. But I think as far as possible, some journals even go so far as to indicate externally, you know, the commitment to authors, you know, we try to publish your articles within a certain number of days, or you will, will try to give you a first decision or final decision on your paper in a certain number of days. Uh, going back to your second question, uh, options for open access. Um, so as a publisher, Wiley, we have a number of open access agreements with institutions or, or major funders or even at the government level. So the idea would be the, the funding for open access comes from a central source. So as an author, you do not have to find the funding yourself. Um, as long as you're, you're eligible and you're based in one of those um, eligible institutions, you'll be able to draw upon the funding. Um, so um, it is all on our homepage. Uh, I can share the link to you. Uh, after this uh, with James that can be distributed. So it all depends on where you're based and then whether um, and whether if your institution is part of the eligible institutions, then the funding will be available. Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Sorry to rush you off. We're a bit tight on time as ever. Um, so would the other two like to come up? Cheryl and Ken, please. I think now we're we're um, just in gen generic questions for everybody. So we'll start with David Martin. Very important question. <laughs> Carol, would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, I think in the in the issue of choosing a journal. Um, Prestige is certainly one of the things that you ought to think about, right? But you also ought to think about, um, right, submitting to a really prestigious journal that's going to desk reject you is not very helpful. Um, so you want to, I mean, you have to choose places that have a good fit for what you're doing. Um, when I'm not, for personally, when I'm not under a short timeline, so not at a point where you're getting ready to go on the job market or something um, where you where the timing might be really an issue. I tend to start a little bit high with my papers, um, submit them to a place where I think they have some chance, but maybe not as good of a chance of getting published. So a more prestigious journal to start with. One of the advantages of that um, is that you often get better comments from better journals. Um, that you can then take and, and do it. Um, again, my suggestion is always to come up with a list of a couple of places that you're interested in, in submitting it so that you, you know when you get rejected from one, what you're gonna do to turn it around and submit it to the next one. Um, and I think it, it depends a lot on where you are in your career, um, what you're trying to do next, whether, whether prestige of the journal is the key thing. And there are moments where that, that really matters. But I think that there's a trade-off between prestige and fit because a more prestigious journal is not necessarily, if it's not a good fit, they're not gonna take it. So you think about the most prestigious journal that you that is a good fit for what you're, what you're working on. Thank you. Okay, there's another general one here this time with Ken. Do you support postgraduate students to submit their dissertations or other ideas? Uh, I think this is actually similar to the question that Murad just addressed before. I mean, obviously the dissertation wouldn't be submitted because the dissertation is longer than a journal article. Uh, so I'm not quite sure I get the question. You would, could submit a paper from your dissertation. I think, they, uh, I think they're asking to what extent do you actually give actively give support to people seeking to publish? Um, 
I'm not sure if we actively give support to people seeking to publish. I mean, we're more than happy to, other than getting reading the papers and sending them out for review and hopefully giving them the very helpful comments that Murat was saying that the you know good review process they should get. But I don't think we can do much more than that. Um, one of the other things that people have to remember is that we're getting lots of submissions and we all have these aren't full-time jobs either. So there's only so much people can do with their time. But can I just add that I think you ought to be getting support from your supervisor, from the people who were um, your assessors. There's a lot of people who have read your dissertation and should be able to help you think about what are the research questions within that that you could pull out and you could turn into a journal article. Yeah. So I, I would tend to think about that what you want to do is, Murat kind of said, not just taking a chapter, but thinking about a particular question that you've answered that you can address in the amount of space that you have in a journal article. And so pulling that out. But I would really encourage everybody before they start trying to, before they submit something, to have conversations with your peers, with your um, with mentors, supervisors, other people. You should always have somebody read it. The first person to read your article should not be the journal editor. You ought to have had several other people read it. You should have gotten comments on it so that you've already incorporated some of those issues before you send it into the into a journal. Can I just say something, Sarah? Can I just add something there? Yeah. Just, just very quickly, and that is just that um, as when your paper get, comes back, if it gets rejected, that's not a problem. As a number of people have said, Murad has said that could be very helpful. As Cheryl was saying, you could sort of use the reviews from one place and then go to the next place. So that it hurts, but that's part of the process and that's part of the learning and the growing process. If you find that you are getting desk reject over and over and over, that means that you're doing something sort of fundamentally problematic about the framing of the paper. And then you really do need to seek sort of consultation. And I think what Cheryl was saying is that, you know, your your PhD supervisor, people in your department, if you're, you know, a postdoc, uh, they could help you with that. But if you're getting if you're getting a lot of desk rejects, that's a problem. Okay. So one, I think quite short one for Cheryl, and then we'll go back to some more general ones. So the question is that we like field-based research. Does that mean experiments and RCTs or is observational data allowed? Certainly any of those kinds of data are allowed. Um, again, I would echo what I heard earlier about RCTs. There's plenty of RCTs going on at the moment that really aren't addressing big, new, interesting questions that are very, 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 very narrowly focused. We probably aren't interested in those. We really want to see that the, the research question that you're addressing is relevant to a broader audience. And then a range of kinds of data that you can use. RCTs, observational data, all kinds, many, many kinds of qualitative data, as well as the kinds of quantitative data that you that you've mentioned. Okay, we've got lots of questions. So one more for you two. Um, which I think will be of general interest, and then hopefully we can have the other two back for a few minutes. The question about cover letters. So I again, I think this is one of these things that is might be just personal perspective of the editor. Uh, I don't care about the cover letter at all. I mean, I read the cover letter, but it's it's immaterial. So. Um, Okay. So from my perspective, it's, 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 it gets meaningless. <laughs> I, I would basically agree. I look at them. I usually look at them. Um, and unless there's something in particular um, that you want the editor to know, there's not mostly, most of them just say, here's a paper. It hasn't been submitted elsewhere. Um, and, and they don't really add anything. And, and we're not really looking, I'm not looking for them to add anything. I wouldn't spend much time on them. Okay. Okay, I'm aware that there's very, very little time to go. Um, we've got a couple of questions about publishing and costs. 
So questions about how much does it cost to publish in journals and also questions about should we go for journals that um, that require a submission price or are they predatory that we should avoid? Can you talk about that? Does it cost to publish in your journals and what about those journals that do charge? So we don't have a cost either for submission or for publication. Um, so, and I think many journal, most journals in development studies don't. There are some disciplines where there are actually page charges for publishing. I, I was trained as an agricultural economist and some of those journals do require page charges. Um, the bigger question about predatory journals is I think you do need to pay attention to predatory journals. There's, I, I kept a list um, one month earlier this year and I had, I think about 80 different journals requesting that I either become a reviewer or a, um, an author for them, most of which were predatory journals. So thinking about journals that you know of that people have published in, again, this is a question you can ask um, mentors and supervisors, but there are a number of journals that don't, that are of no benefit to you and are predatory. So you want to keep away from those, but I'm not sure it's just based on whether whether there's a cost of doing it because some of that is quite discipline specific. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the other two to come up just for a, a one or two more questions. I think we may be able to collect these questions and send them as, as emails perhaps, because um, there are more questions than we've got time to answer. Um, so there are two questions, I'm gonna bring them together. One is about do your chances of getting the paper published reduce if you've sent it to more than one journal? And the other is about whether you would publish something that has already been published as a, as a working paper or in the conference proceedings. So would one of you like to answer those? Um, go ahead. Go. Yeah, I'll take the second one because I think um, the idea of working papers and preprints, again, that's becoming more and more widespread. Um, so I think we have, most journals will probably have evolved their stance on this. I think it used to be that working papers and preprints are a big no-no, but we recognize that they do have value. Um, and then, you know, they are part of the re uh, overall research ecosystem. So what I would say um, is that um, you make that upfront. Uh, it's interesting that in the previous question was about cover letters, is that really necessary? But then uh, if there is one piece of information you might want to include in cover letters would be whether you've previously published this paper as a working paper or in a preprint. Um, the reason for that is because quite a lot of journals, we use a um, plagiarism software detector. So if, and you know, and this de a software detector will actually troll through preprints as well and sometimes it will return high matches because of this but then if you know that but if you do disclose this information up front you know when we get the report back you know there will always be a human person looking through the report but then if we know that you've disclosed this information up front we will be able to make a, a, a judgment there and say that you know this is still fine and therefore you know we'll, we'll evaluate the, the paper and decide whether to send it out for a review or not. Right. Yeah, just to add on that, uh, it's extremely unlikely that a working paper would end up in a journal as is after the review process. So I don't mind if it's a working paper. By the time uh, the referees and the editors are done with it, you have a new paper in hand. So it doesn't, you know, think things don't. Uh, it doesn't matter too much um, about submitting to more than one journal. I mean, this might be obvious, but I'll say it, don't submit to more than one journal at the same time. I think that, that's a big no-no. Um, wait uh, for one journal to to decide before you go to the next one. There's no harm in sort of like working down a list, but uh, it's rare that I think the exact same paper can go from one journal to the other one. You might need to just make minor changes, uh, uh, you know, the introduction might need to change the debates. The references might uh, need to move around a little bit. I wouldn't just copy and paste uh, immediately. I would try to tailor the paper to the right journal. 
but uh, there's no harm in moving down the list. And I think editors understand we are all authors as well. So we all do the same thing. Okay. I think we're going to have to close there. There's one question which I, I think I'll answer, um, which is, if the percentage is coming true, all but roughly 15 on this session will get a desk reject. How do you encourage ECR in such a system? And I think, um, speaking from my own experience, the only way to encourage you is to say it happens to all of us. So I have been more rejected in the last um, three or four years than ever in my whole career. Um, it hurts, it hurts everybody. Um, it's a very painful process. Um, but generally, once you kind of put the rejection in the drawer and kind of recover yourself, and then maybe a few weeks later, maybe even a month or two later, you can face going back to it, you do find that actually some of the suggestions that have been made are helpful and you do end up with a better paper. But just be aware everybody is going through it. None of us has a magic a magic kind of formula that gets us published every time. So although it can be really painful as an early career, um, it's the way it is. And the rest of us are suffering also. That's all I can say. Thank you all. The book session starts pretty much now. So if you're interested in that, close this browser and go and join them there and I will see you there. Thank you all to all of you from the journal. That's been really helpful, helpful quest, set of questions and answers. Um, and we will gather the questions, James, can we do that? Hopefully we can gather the questions um, that haven't managed to be answered. Well, thank you all.